If you have your Bibles and would turn with me to Colossians chapter number 3, Colossians chapter number 3, we uh, began this series going through the book of Colossians and uh, walking through it really verse by verse and passage by passage, and so um, I have thoroughly enjoyed it as we've gone through it, and uh, it has been a help to my Christian life and to my spiritual walk, and I pray it has been to you as well. Um, There were handouts on the way in, and I believe the ushers have some of those. If you did not get one of those, um, they'll be happy to to get one to you as we kind of introduce where we are at. We began chapter number three really uh, two weeks ago as we attached it and kind of tied in chapter number two along with it. And um, chapter number two really walks us through the, the things that the Bible and the, the, our spiritual life and our Christian life uh, call us not to be a part of. And then chapter number three gives us some commands of how we should begin living. And so we started last week a, a two part study of chapter number three, and we will be in part number two of that, and then we will finish out chapter number three next week. And I want to go ahead and just put a little advertisement in for what's coming next week as we'll look at establishing sufficient relationships. Establishing sufficient relationships from verses 18 down through verse number 25 of chapter number 3, but goes on to end to verse number 6. And so a little plug as far as what's coming. We'll finish this up here in two or three weeks, and uh, you can go back and hopefully have things in your Bible that, you can, that you've learned, that you can take, that you can apply. Anytime you go back and read the book of Colossians, one of my favorite things to do is to sit down and read a book in one sitting, um, just to grab my Bible and to try to read through a whole book. And so here a couple months ago, uh, my wife and I were on a trip and uh, sat down on the back porch of a cabin and read through the book of Colossians. And it has spoken to me day in and day out since that moment. And so a lot of what we are teaching through these last couple of weeks has been things that have come out in my own personal study and personal life. And so we rejoice in what the Lord continues to do. If you would stand with me for the reading of uh, our passage this evening of Colossians chapter chapter number 3, verses 12 through 17, as we look at living the sufficient life, part number 2. The Bible says this in verse number 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Would you go back up and would you look at verse number 15 and would you read that out loud together with me? Verse number 15 of Colossians chapter number 3, ready, begin. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And then would you go and read verse number 17 out loud together with me? Ready? Begin. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Over the next couple of minutes, we just want to begin to really take all that we've heard about the sufficient life that is found in Jesus Christ and find out how we can apply it. How do we plug it in? How do we take the things that we believe and begin to actually practice them? And so really what we've given you over the last two weeks, if you include this week, will be six ways, six points that you can plug into applying the sufficient life to to your own personal Christian life. And so we'll finish those last three of of those six this evening. Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I ask this evening that you would speak to my heart. Lord, I pray that you would use the text that is in front of us to apply it to our hearts and to our lives, and Lord, that you would allow us to see that living this sufficient life that you have called us to is so fulfilling. And God, I pray that there would be people in this room that this evening they would walk out and they would 
have a different perspective of the life that you have called them to. Lord, it is a life of freedom. It is a life of joy. It is a life of peace when we simply do it your way. Lord, I pray that you give me the words to say this evening. Lord, I pray that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. We live in an age of information. We have so much information at our fingertips that in some ways it almost feels like we're overwhelmed with it. And even in the midst of all of the information that we receive, the truth is that we know most of what we should be doing in a lot of areas. Even though the internet has been developed and you, we have social media and we have TV and we have news and we have email, even, even though we have all of these things, there are certain things that we know to be true, like this invaluable fact that I'm about to share with you. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. How many of you had your apple today? Okay, good, seven of you, good job. The rest of us will be at our doctor's appointments tomorrow. How about this one? Red skies in the morning, sailors. Red skies at night. How many of you got really scared during the eclipse? Okay. We have certain things that we know. We know that Cheerios lower cholesterol, and yet I have not had a bowl in probably since the nursery, okay? We know certain things about life. We know different things. We, we've all heard this one, that you can't have your cake and what? Eat it. eat it too. And yet every year on my birthday, I have my cake and I eat it. And I don't let anybody else eat it. The truth is, is that there are certain things, while we joke about very small things, like the phrases we just gave, there are many things that we know to be right, yet we choose not to do them. There are many things that we know to be true and that should be a part of our lives, and yet we often fail to simply plug them in and apply them. The great truth of the Christian life is that it is not found in the knowledge of living the Christian life, but in the doing of the Christian life. And there are many Christians in today's society that they, they cannot understand why, they, why their Christian life feels maybe so begrudging, why it feels so burdensome, why they don't have victory over sin. And it, it's not because the knowledge is not there, but it's simply because the doing and the action is not there. Some people describe that the longest journey in anyone's life is the 18 inches it takes for something that is in your mind to become a part of your heart. You can know plenty of health needs and plenty of ways that you can be a healthy person, but until you actually do them, you will not experience the benefit of them. And you can know plenty of things about the Christian life, but until they become a part of who you are, you will not experience the benefit of them, which is why I believe that I came across an epistle that Paul wrote to the American church. We've got a little bit of a text from it tonight that I want to show you if we can flash that picture up on the screen. This is Paul's epistle to the United States of America. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, Christ Jesus to the churches of the United States of America, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't even really know where to begin with you guys. And the sad thing is that if we were to receive a letter that was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God from the hands of someone like a Paul, my fear is that the American churches would look more like 1st and 2nd Corinthians than Colossians or Philippians. That Paul would be writing and he would be saying, I, 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 I don't understand. You have all of the information, you have all of the knowledge, and yet you have not applied any of it. You have not done what God has called you to do. And so this evening, I want us to close out with three more thoughts before we move into the relationships section of this book of what does living the sufficient life actually look like? We gave you three thoughts from the beginning of chapter number three down through verse number 11, but tonight we'll look at verses 12 through 17 and give you three more. The first one 
is simply this, that living the sufficient life looks like putting on something new or putting something new on, as it's worded there in your handout. It looks like putting something new on. We closed last week with verse number 11 and and verse number 10, and he, he already kind of introduces this thought in verse 10. He says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. He closes out in verse number 11 and says, Christ is all and in all. And so in light of that truth and in light of that fact, verse number 12 says this, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness." We close with an illustration of what it might look like for us to continue to stay in the old man versus putting on something that Jesus Christ has tailor-made for you in the new man. There's many Christians that today they live their lives just satisfied with the life and the look and the feel of the old man rather than enjoying the comfort and the appearance and the joy of the new man. And so when we talk about what does the sufficient life look like, what we must understand is that it gives the appearance of putting something new on. I want to walk you through a scenario that most maybe men will understand. Let's pretend and suppose for just a moment that you've had all day Saturday and like most men on Saturdays, they go and they find their second date, which is their mower, okay? Okay. They're weed eater, those things. They're, they're going and, and get on the mower. In fact, I came home on Saturday after our men's prayer breakfast and I had some things that I was supposed to be doing, uh, taxes. And um, I had some things that my wife and I, we had said, you know, we were gonna set this time uh, aside. And, and so I was standing there and she was getting ready to run to an appointment that she had had. And uh, I was standing there and I said, and she's like, so are you gonna, are you gonna finish up the taxes? I was like, yeah. And I just stood there for a second. I said, I think I'm going to go mow. And she said, I, I could tell by the way that you were standing there, you were about to say, I think I'm going to go mow. And so I went and I hopped on the mower and then she had to run to something. I found all sorts of things that I could do that were much more important than taxes. I put out ant traps. I weeded. I sprayed for weeds. I did everything that I wanted to do rather than the thing that I didn't want to do. But let's suppose for just a moment you've had a Saturday work day. You come in, the grass clippings are all over you, you've been out in the yard, you're hot, you're sweaty, you, you've got grease all over you, maybe you did a little bit of work on the vehicles, maybe, it was, maybe you got into something where you were throwing mulch, you, it was just a hard day of work. And so just like every, every day that you've had before that, you come in, you get showered up, you get cleaned up, and you walk out and you've got your wedding tux on. And you've got cologne on, you fixed your hair, you, you just look, you are dressed to the nines. Like yeah, everything just looks great. What is your wife's response going to be in that moment other than what in the world are you doing? It's going to be, why are you wearing that? What? Well, I, th- I figured that we'd put in a, I'd put in a hard day of work, and so tonight we are going to the best steakhouse in town. We're going to go, and we're going to enjoy an opportunity with each other. And please understand this. What catches her attention is that there's something new on. There's a different appearance. There's a different look what was once grungy, dirty, smelly, sweaty, stinky husband is now sharply dressed, smelling good, looking nice, wedding day ready husband, date ready husband, because there is a difference between the old and the new. And there are many Christians that they want to live in the smut of their sin and the grunginess of their past life but they want the attention and the appearance of something new. And you cannot, please don't miss this in regards to your Christian life, you cannot have 
the look, smell, and feel of the old man and the benefits of the new man. It doesn't work that way. In this passage, what Paul says is he says, you are putting something new on and the attention should be drawn to, I knew this person from their past. I knew this person's problems. I knew that what they were involved in, but now I see that they are new. And so what does that look like? First of all, you'll see this, that you put on the characteristics of God. There are two types of characteristics of our Heavenly Father and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There are communicable attributes and characteristics, and there are incommunicable incommunicable attributes and characteristics. The communicable ones are the ones that we we can show in our lives. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's holiness. Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father, God, they show them to perfection, but there are things that we cannot have translated into our lives. We are not omniscient. We are not omnipresent. We are not omnipotent. Those are powers and those are characteristics of our God that cannot be communicated to us. But there are attributes and characteristics of our God that we can exhibit. Paul gives several of them in verse number 12. He uses the term holy and beloved, vows of mercy. Then he says kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. He says in forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you'll see that you can put on the characteristics of God. The new man looks a lot more like Jesus than it looks like Joel. You put your name in that blank. The new man looks a lot more like Jesus than it looks like me. When I walk into a room, when I I walk into a meeting, I don't want people to see Joel. I want people to see Jesus through Joel. And every single one of us should have a desire not to be seen by the world around us, but for Jesus Christ to be seen through us. Secondly, you'll notice that you put on the forgiveness of Christ. You could cross-reference this verse number 13 with Ephesians 4.32. A very popular verse. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Isn't it interesting that these two verses, both times that Paul references forgiveness, he references it in the context of the forgiveness that you have been that you have received. I've said this before, but forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. If you are holding a grudge, if you are holding bitterness toward another Christian, toward another person in your life, you have experienced the ultimate forgiveness from Jesus Christ, and so now you can forgive those around you. Two times Paul writes to a church and he says, you practice forgiveness based off of the forgiveness that you have received. So you put on the forgiveness of Christ and then thirdly, you put on the love of God. Verse number 14, he says this, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Above all these things, put on charity. It's almost as if he's giving us a look into the Christian's wardrobe of how we should enter into this world. I go through a checklist, it feels like, almost every morning of things that I need to put on, things I need to put in my pocket. One of the last things that I do before I walk out the door is the the pat down, right? Okay? And I don't even know what I'm really thinking in that moment other than that if there's something in every pocket, surely I've got everything I need. If I'm feeling about 12 pounds heavier, I've probably got all that I could ever carry. And so you do the quick pat down, make sure you've got everything. And please understand this, we would never walk out the door physically without certain things on and certain things in our pocket. And yet there are many Christians who walk out the door each and every day not clothed in the spirit of the living God, not clothed in love, not clothed in the new man, not covered in the righteousness of God, not covered in the spirit of God, and we act like that's okay. 
There's some of you, you would not be caught dead without your wallet or your purse or, or certain things because, well, I just never know what's gonna happen. There's certain of you that you would not be caught dead without your cell phone. And yet we will live a life and we'll go through a day's time and we'll never once consider the love that God has called us to put on. Secondly here, not only does living the sufficient life look like putting something new on, but living the sufficient life looks like giving permission to God. You say, how, did you, how do you see that in verses 15 and 16? I want you to see this. I love verse 15 and 16. I want you to read the word when I stop in verse number 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What's the first word of verse number 16? Let. What he gives us the appearance of in this verse, in these verses, is this. That you have the ability to give permission to your heavenly Father to allow him to do what he has called you, what he, has, what he can do in your life. And the sad truth is that there are many Christians who the reason why they miss the peace of God is because they have not given it permission to rule their life. The reason why they miss being thankful is because they haven't given it permission to enter into their life. This is the reason why they miss the joy and and letting the word of God dwell in you richly, as he says, is because there's been no permission given. And we will give permission to TV shows, to social media influencers, to people who do not even believe like we do. We will give them permission to fill and infiltrate our headspace and our heart space, and then we'll deny and reject the Word of God. We'll give permission for Fox News and CNN or whoever you listen to. We'll give permission for them to invade our hearts and our minds with all of the negative news. And then we wonder why we don't have the peace of God dwelling in our lives. It's because what you give permission to is what's going to enter. No one has come into my home that I have not given permission to enter into. I've never accidentally ended up with a salesman eating breakfast at my table. And you will not accidentally end up with the peace of God dwelling in your life. It will be based off of intentionality of what you let in. And until you give permission to your heavenly father to say, he has peace, he has access to it. But if you have shut it out, if you have allowed everything else to fill your life, you will not enjoy it. So it looks like giving permission to God to say, this is what I have, let me put it into your life. So here's what you are giving permission to. First of all, you give permission to the peace of God. He says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Can I just ask you a simple question this evening from that verse? What rules your heart? What rules your heart? I can tell you this right now that there are four people on this planet that are a part of my family that rule very much of what Joel Norse does. They have my heart. And so because of that, I'm willing to sacrifice for them. Because of that, I'm willing to give to them. Because of that, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for them to have the life that I believe that God wants them to have. But please understand this. There are many people in this world who allow the things of this world to rule their hearts. They allow everything else but God, the peace of God, to rule your heart. And I can tell you a great litmus test for how to know what rules your heart. What got you worked up this week? What upset you this week? Because what bothers you the most is typically a sign of what you are beholden to. And unless it is the peace of an almighty God, you will never experience all that God has for you. 
It's interesting to me that he says that let the peace of God rule your heart. It's almost as if there's this kingdom that lives within us and there's a constant competition for the right to the throne. I love the word that is used in James chapter number four. It's the Greek word antetasso. It gives us this sign. It's actually a word for battle. And it gives us this illustration of that there is a constant jockeying for position in your life. There's a constant fight for your heart. And the sad truth is that there are many Christians tonight all across this room and all across our world and all across our country who what they've done is they've given up the fight and they've just given the rule of their heart to the world. They've handed the throne over, they've handed the crown over, and then they wonder why the peace of God doesn't control them. They wonder why they're worked up over every little change in their life. They wonder why they're pursuing the things that don't really bring the blessings of God. They wonder all these things. It's because what sits on the throne of your heart is what controls you. Don't expect to put worldly pleasures in the throne of your heart and have the peace of God as a byproduct. Secondly, you give permission to the word of God. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I love the word dwell here as well. It's taking up residence, it's living. It's in you, it's a part of who you are. I mentioned that I I have never had a stranger sneak into my house uninvited, haven't given them permission. The same is true with furniture. How many of you, you've ever, you're, you've come home, maybe this is more of a husband illustration, okay? But you've come home and like something doesn't feel right. Where's, where, what was right here? There was, some, there was a chair here, wasn't there? And you know what lives in your house. You know what abides there. And sometimes it just kind of feels off. Maybe your wife, while you're gone at work, they rearrange the furniture. And it reminds you of children's church when you go to sit down and the person behind you pulls the chair out. The chair that you've sat in for 10 years all of a sudden is not there. You can't can't fix muscle memory like that. You're going to go in and plop down in the chair. Whether it's there or not, you're going down. And what he says in this verse is, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it stake claim in your life. Let it be there. But then he says, let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Right now, if we ask the question, what did the stock market do today? There would be people that would be able to answer just like that. But if we ask for a verse on prayer, there'd be a lot of Christians that would have to, wow, I know there's that one that pastor always quotes about, you know, praying. If we asked right now for the scores to last night's game, there would be some, including Braxton Norris, who would be able to spout them out. Oh yeah, so-and-so's in first place here, and this is that. And yet if we asked for a verse of comfort in a time of need, we wouldn't know. And it's simply because We've allowed the things of this world to take up residence in a space that was prepared for the word of God. The devil is not going to make it easy for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. He's going to make it difficult. He's going to throw every distraction he can at you. Thirdly, you give permission to the people of God. He says this, teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching and admonishing one another. I believe that every Christian should have someone in their life that has the voice and the ability to say, this is something that's, that I'm noticing in you. I have been so blessed as a child of God to have people around me 
who are willing to sharpen me. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron, and so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And there are too many Christians that they avoid fellowship because they, believe, they, they don't want fellowship to turn into discipleship. They, they don't want fellowship to turn into, well, I don't want to get too close to them because he's kind of like super holy and like I really like what I want to watch. I, I, I'm okay. I don't want to get too close to that couple. They just love the word of God too much. They're just way too involved. They're going to ask us to go, go knock on doors and I just, I, I can't do it. And the Bible puts us in the context of the local church. What does Hebrews 10, 25 say? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And what does it say in the very next verse? Why is he saying that? He's not saying that because he really cares about a good number at church attendance. He's not saying that for a bulletin announcement. He's not saying that so that we have mega churches. He says to provoke one another to love and to good works. The reason why you show up to church is not to fill a seat. It's so that you can be a part of someone else's spiritual growth. It's so that someone else can be a part of your spiritual growth. He says, teaching and admonishing one another. One of the greatest joys of the life of every Christian is when there's another Christian who comes alongside of them and maybe it's a word of encouragement, maybe it's a prayer, maybe it's a hug, maybe it's a note, maybe it's a rebuke, maybe it's something that just says, this is something that changed when so-and-so talked to me. Teaching and admonishing one another, but then fourthly as you give permission to the praise of God. I love this. I love that he says, let the peace of God dwell in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let other people speak into your life and show you what God has for you. But then he closes this with something that almost feels off script. He says, teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Do you know what would revolutionize the Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night services of Franklin Road Baptist Church? is if we began to give permission to God for us to praise him. It's unbelievable to me that it is natural to rejoice in a touchdown, but it's unnatural to rejoice in the salvation of Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable to me that we have gotten to the point as Christians to where it is acceptable to rejoice in a pay raise, but it is unacceptable to rejoice in the Bible teaching us what God shows us from his word. That's, that is the complacency, that is the apathy that we find ourselves in to where we have normalized the carnal and we have abnormalized the spiritual. It feels weird to rejoice in what God has done. It feels awkward to, to raise a hand in church and to think and to, and to have tears flow down your eyes as you think about what Jesus Christ has done for you. That feels weird, but you put yourself in a grandstand with a bunch of other people wearing orange or crimson or whatever your color is, okay? Purple, I don't even know. Like, whatever it is, you put yourself in that and all of a sudden it feels very natural. Please understand this. Please understand this, Christian there are movements in this world that are praising the carnal and their excitement level is attracting the younger generation while the church grows cold and quiet. I don't know about you, but I have yet to see a march, and I'm not going to idolize it or give it any airtime in this evening service, but I have yet to see a march down the streets of New York City or Los Angeles that waves their flag silently and quietly. But meanwhile, the church, you can hear a pin drop. And so what do you think a younger generation is going to be attracted to? What do you think that people actually think that someone believes? If you can tell, you can't go to a stadium and walk out and say, well, those people, they weren't really fans. You can't go to a stadium on this planet and say, well, they didn't, I mean, they just kind of showed up. And yet, there are people who walk out of a church each and every day, I don't know that there were people in there that believed that. 
But for you to experience what God has called you to, there must be permission for you just to praise God. For you to rejoice in what God has done. And then lastly is this, and we'll close. Living the sufficient life looks like glorifying God. Living the sufficient life just simply looks like glorifying God. There's really nothing else to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Verse number 17 of our passage this evening says this, and whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Christian, this evening, have you given every word or deed over to your Savior? Have you given him every aspect of your life? Have you given him everything for his honor and for his glory? I got a pay raise today, glory to God. I got fired today, glory to God. I got a clean bill of health today, glory to God. I got a bad diagnosis today, glory to God. You see, for many of us, we would praise ourselves for the blessings and blame God for the burdens. I got a pay raise today. God, I got fired today. Are you serious? I got a clean bill of health. It must have been all that broccoli and those apples that I've been eating. God, really you brought sickness into my life? And here's what the sufficient life looks like. Whether it is the mountaintop or whether it is the valley, all glory goes to God. Whether it's great or whether it's bad, all glory goes to God. Whether I am noticed or whether I am not, all glory goes to God. We have gotten so far away from that as Christians in 2024. To the point to where we've almost become professionals at saying we're glorifying God and yet somehow still making it about ourselves. Well, glory to God, look what I got to do. It's either glory to God or glory to you. It can't be both. It's either about Jesus or it's about you. It can't be both. Jesus Christ is not going to split the limelight with anyone. Nor should he have to. And the best thing that you will ever do in your life as a child of God is just simply step aside and let him steal the show. Let him have the stage. Let people see him. Let people glorify him. Let people rejoice in him through you. I want to simply close with this quote in some ways is, is humorous. It came from St. Francis de Salas, probably one of your best friends, okay? But it says this, some men become proud because they ride a fine horse, wear a feather in their hat, or are dressed in a fine suit of clothes. Who does not see the folly of this? If there be any glory in such things, it belongs to the horse, the bird, and the tailor. Some of you are like, I have no clue where the feather, horse, or tailor come in. Who's tailor? I want to read it again in case it flies over your head. Some men become proud because they ride a fine horse, wear a feather in their hat, 
or are dressed in a fine suit of clothes. Who does not see the folly of this? If there be any glory in such things, it belongs to the horse, the bird, and the tailor. What he's simply trying to say is this. What we often make about us is ultimately about someone else. You could rephrase this phrase for 2024 and say some men take pride in their homes their cars their business ventures the success of their life what they do who they are but the truth is that the folly and the failure of that thinking is that it was all God who gave you the health to earn your money who gave you the mind to do the things that you've done Who gave you the physical capacity to wake up and to work? Who did all of those things for you? It it wasn't you by your own upbringing. It was God through you. And just as silly as it is for someone to walk up and to take credit for the clothes that they're wearing when someone else made them or to take credit for the horse that they're riding or the car that they're driving, what we should step back and say is whatever good comes through my life is to the glory of God. Whatever you see in the life of Joel Norse is not Joel Norse, it's Jesus Christ. And whatever good comes out of your life, your family, your home, your finances is not to your glory, it is to the glory of God. You say, well, why does that matter? Why does it matter if I get the glory or God gets the glory? It matters because what you do with it will determine who it was actually for. God gave you health, how did you serve him? God gave you wealth, what did you give to him? God gave you a family, how did you steward and disciple them and point them to Jesus? God gave you a church, what are you doing in it? You see, everything comes down to the glory of Jesus Christ. I have a post-it note on my uh, screen, on, on my computer. And the phrase simply says this, it all ends at the feet of Jesus. When we entered into this life, it was because God chose to. And when we are taken out of this life, it will be because God chose to. And where we started with God will end with God, and there will be many Christians that when it ends at the feet of Jesus... They won't have anything to show for it because they lived their life for themselves and not for where it ended. And you can take glory in the life that you have built or you can take the life that God has built and give him glory because he is the only one that is sufficient with every head.